So I was born in Missouri, actually, in Springfield. And uh, my father soon left the family after I was born. Uh, my father was a crazy person. <laughs> my mother was the complete polar opposite. And so I find myself later in life dealing with opposing sides, duality. I seem to be very focused on the interesting things that are in the world that are very black and white, night and day. And we see that in the culture and the media exposure in America. Everyone just loves to polarize everything, which I think is just completely unfair to everything and everybody and nature. So anyway, I grew up near Wichita. We moved there. I was babysat with my grandmother. My mother worked all the time. She had to. She had to support me and two other brothers. Um, and we kind of lived out in the country. And my grandmother had an old barn there. And so I was a very strange kid. I would take up some of the bricks there and build little temples and put some dead animals in there. So I'm just trying to warm you up to who I am. Please don't be afraid. I'm more afraid than you are. So in my youth, I had lots of rural seclusion. My grandmother was very intelligent. She could have been a, a history professor, really. So I learned about some historical things. Uh, my mother married an alcoholic stepfather, which is awesome. <laughs> um, I listened to heavy metal because, you know, life is just too intense. When it's, you know, out of the middle of nowhere, what do you do? You know, way too young to start drinking too, so. Um, but I was really good at drawing art. I mean, I just loved to draw. I got really cocky at a young age, first grade, I'm like, all right, all you kids, I'm going to show you up. I'm going to draw better than all of you. So, <clears throat> nowadays, I'm completely humble. You know, really got over that. Uh, I was really intrigued with nature and anatomy. You know, I just loved dead animals. I just loved to take dead birds and just kind of pull them apart and look at them. So, anyway. Um, but, you know, when you're at that age, it's innocent. It really is. You know, it's kind of a taboo, but... You know, you had to have people like Da Vinci and those kinds of people to really start pulling apart dead things and knowing about them. You know, it's just a quest for knowing. So, influences. Yes, I'm very hypersensitive, aren't we all? Uh, intrigued by the strange and the macabre. I'm very intrigued by the effects of religion. You know, I mentioned the West, Westboro Baptist Church. So I'm very interested in religious fanaticism and what it does to people and the effects of it. Uh, I was grown up in kind of a strict Catholic environment, so good thing I wound up kind of uh, self-medicating myself with art. Yeah. Um, politics and government, which everyone loved. History and the repeat of history. History always repeats itself and people just they don't know their history, and or they forget, and they just end up doing it over and over. So it's just a part of life. Uh, science and enlightenment, I think, are just amazing. Uh, spirituality, I'm really absorbed into that. So the name change. So I was born as Chris Cooksey, and I was reborn as Chris Cooksey. I just changed the spelling a little. You know, it's like I gotta be more exotic, you know, I can't look like I'm just some normal person, so. And, uh, you know, it keeps people guessing uh, about the origin. So somebody earlier asked, you know, where'd your name come from? So, now you know. Uh, and maybe it has a bit of a marketing touch. So, it seems, you know, it looks exotic. You know, if you had a whole list of artists in front of you, you know, you, you kind of look at what's interesting, just from the name, and so, it does look interesting. Doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so here are some things about painting. So I got a Bachelor of Masters in painting. And I was influenced by the fantastic realist, which probably none of you besides Carrie have heard of. There's H.R. Geeker, which how, how many have heard of H.R. Geeker? And why is that? Ailey. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Robert Venosa. Besides Carrie, <laughs> Alex Gray, Woo! yes, if 
you ever hear Alex Gray, somebody screaming? <laughs> Ernst Fuchs. No, it's not Fox, it's Fuchs. That's why he never made it in America. <laughs> Uh, he's an incredible Austrian, fantastic realist, so if you're writing notes again, look up Ernst Fuchs. You'll be blown away. So I also studied old master painting techniques in Florence, Italy, and Austria. And this is a technique that involves a tempera, emulsion, where you take an egg and you mix it with titanium white. It's, it's sort of a glazing technique or grisaille technique, where you paint the lights, the forms to start with, and then you glaze color, and then you paint whites over it again, and then you glaze. It's a huge, long, painstaking process that hardly anyone has any patience for. And you have to use the egg emulsion quickly because it starts rotting. So, But I'm, a, I'm, I'm an acrylic painter, and so I love the challenge of acrylics. And so I also developed a airbrush technique. And this is an example of one of them. This is four by five feet, so it's probably about actual size there. And so I kind of applied an old master painting technique with that. <coughs> and so uh, I do have kind of a succession of this very piece in stages. So I'll show you that at some point. So I'll kind of jump around here. In terms of painting, um, like I said, an acrylic technique using multiple layers of thin watery glazes over and over and over to build it. Uh, interestingly enough, there was a guy uh, talking about Liquitex paint that was here yesterday. So it was kind of neat to be absorbed into some other things about acrylic that I didn't know, and things about acrylic that I disagree with. You know. uh, it's kind of the same application of the old master technique, it's just sort of modified. Uh, here is an example of a portrait. This original is about four by nine inches, so it's very small. And so the other one was very big, and this one is very small. I hardly ever do anything in between. I don't know why, just either big or small. So anyway, this is a painting that's done with brush, so not airbrush. And so you can see quite a bit of detail in there. I paint every little hair. So it was, it was quite a nice piece. This is that one up close. Lots of hair. Here are some floral works that I've done. Uh, these are seven inches tall by five inches wide. Uh, you know, these are technical challenges. And, you know, flowers are obviously very beautiful and lovely. They're symmetrical. They're very... Uh, just wonderful forms, and to paint them is just really uh, soul soothing. And so the one on the right there is probably my most recent one, and probably the most challenging one because it incorporated water droplets. So, you know, if you can give me a critique, it's pretty good. Is it alright? Yeah. Yeah. There's a dog. It's a dead dog. Oh. My dentist. Um, Instead of charging me, he said, why don't you paint a picture of my dead dog <laughs> while I was alive. Here's a picture of it while I was alive. So this is a memorial piece to, it was, uh, it was called Babe. So this is Babe. Hello, Babe. Uh, I have a very good friend in Hayes, Kansas, who's like the world's most renowned moth painter. This guy named John Cody. Has anyone heard of him? Besides Gary. <laughs> He's an amazing moth painter, so look him up to John Cody. Uh, he's, he's been called the Audubon of Moths. So he goes all over the world and, and collects rare exotic moths. And so I did a little piece uh, for him. And this is, the original is three by five inches. So this is way beyond its normal size. But this is a uh, Luna moth. Is a rose? Everyone loves roses. Here's a Catalea orchid. Uh, really tried to get really good photographic effects with that. And these are all acrylic, by the way. And this man is George. George is a homeless man who is the sweetest guy on earth. He lives there in Hayes. And so I approached George one evening in the library. 
And um, I said, George, can I paint your portrait? He said, how much does it cost? I'm like, don't worry, I'll pay you. He's like, okay. <laughs> and uh, he's ultra, ultra religious. I mean, he has to talk about something from the Bible. But, you know, he's not in your face about it. He just loves to share it. And I think that's just really wonderful. You know, I think respecting people's religious uh, beliefs is wonderful. But I think when you get to the point where you're enforcing it, you know, challenging people, you know, that's another story. But he's someone that you can really admire. And he always has a twinkle in his eye, and he never swears. It's just amazing. And he always wants to help me. So I, got, so I thought, you know, gosh, I really need to paint this guy. So I've done several paintings, but this one wound up in the Smithsonian. There was a big national portrait competition uh, in 2006. And this was one of 51. Oh, yeah, it's only like this big. Uh, six by six inches. So uh, George got famous, and he was hanging in the Smithsonian. So it was so delightful about that. And the script writer of Young and the Restless bought this. <laughs> yeah, so. so I do some drawing too. This is an example of a drawing from 2002. And so, mostly familiar with my sculptural work, you kind of see some, maybe some emergings of my sculptural elements into this. So I love fusing the organic with other non-living and living things. This is uh, done in white charcoal on this black paper from Japan, which is no longer made. Not because of the tsunami, but it, it just wasn't made a long time ago. And so this is, uh, it's called Barasinga. Barasinga is a, uh, a, it's like a deer of some sort. Maybe no one's ever heard of that. So, now what you're really here for in the sculpture. So, it's a mixed media technique called assemblage. Assemblage. Uh, gluing multiple items together, in my case, thousands of items. Uh, composing and arranging from a source of found slash bought materials. In fact, I buy most everything. I spend a fortune on it. And uh, I paint and finish is added to it afterwards. So I first created one in uh, 1995, just out of you know just real random impulse to fuse these old models and collectibles together. No real formula at first, you know, just completely cerebral. Uh, painted with acrylic when completed. Uh, I made a few in the 90s up to 2000, um, but I thought it was just kind of nonsense, so I focused on painting. Got my degrees, worked on gallery shows. I got into a few galleries, like in DC, here and there. Uh, did no more assemblages until 2004, when a friend influenced me to do them again. And thus, Parasite and Host was born. And that's this one. So this is a, a big ceiling medallion, probably about 33 inches in width. And um, these are plastic bones. I never use real bones. Although there are some real bird skulls in there. So this is the first one I did in 2004. Everybody loved it. So I did another one. It's called Mouth of Hades. And uh, does anyone know who Chris Mars is? A few people do. Great. He's an artist. Um, he's pretty well known. So he and his wife bought this. And so I was really thrilled about that. And so they said, why don't you contact some galleries and uh, you know, show some more of this work. And so I started doing that. But I really got into you know, what, what was the influence of these things. And it was mostly by the Baroque and <coughs> capturing the essence of classical art but creating a new aesthetic that fuses the old world and the new together. And so the soft with the rigid, the flow of the Baroque, and the harshness of the modern world. So in the modern world, we see very harsh angles, very gridded forms and patterns, and, um, but, but somehow making that work with like, the flow and the fluidity of the, the classical world. And, you know, not just a, an aesthetic thing, but also, you know, getting a message across. 
And so my approach to art is, you know, don't be influenced by art necessarily, but make a message behind it. Uh, but these are about uh, a possible future. You know, what if our culture somehow collapses and rises again, and we have to make something out of the rubble? So it's an idea of taking all that's been around us and creating something new, a new culture and world borrowed from what was there before. Uh, it's sort of futurism in some way with a touch of the classical age. And more so as a lesson for those alive today. So it's, you know, we seem to be very focused on life nowadays because it seems to be very teetering on this collapse or, you know, obviously some changes coming up. And I mean, who in this, in this room is prepared for any changes, you know? I mean, if you ask yourself, what are you going to do when there's no more power? What are you going to do when uh, there's no oil or petroleum? Celebrate. Yeah. yeah. Biodiesel. Yes. And so, you know, my work kind of has something to do with that. Kind of. Well, of course it does. So this is uh, a piece called A Neo-Roman Landscape. And so this is a recent piece. So it kind of ties in all that I was mentioning. A bit of a classical world with some very linear pipe-like pipe -like shapes, uh, multi-layered. And so it's, there's usually a horizon of some form where everything rests upon, but then there's an underworld as well. So this is a recent one. How big is it? This is, um, it's about three feet by three feet. Is it in the round, or? It hangs on the wall. Most of these hang on the wall. There are some that are in the round. So again, this one's called a heroic abduction, and this one is about 30 inches tall. So you like it? Yeah. It's a lot to absorb, isn't it? So there are thousands and thousands of these little parts, and the question I always get, I always hate, is how long did it take? <laughs> I don't know. And that's what I have to tell them. I don't know how long it takes. I know it takes a long time, but you know, I don't know if it's 93 hours, 97 hours. But you know, there, there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of mental thought process going on, and a lot of it's improvised. So it's sort of made up as, it, as, as I go. And so there's, there's you know, I, I try not to formulate it too much. You know, there is some, I guess, stages or technique there, but I try to be fresh every time. Uh, so I do this series called The Church Tank. <laughs> yes. So what does this uh, say to you? You don't believe that. Religion is going to kill you. America, church and state. Yeah, church and state, yes. Um, so what's funny about this piece is this is, uh, this is Church Tank Type 8 with artillery flak. First take type one was a very simple take, uh, you know, just a pudgy little cannon coming out the front door. And so the idea is that each one gets more developed, a little bit bigger, a little bit more sophisticated. So it's just like any military vehicle we would make today. It's always an improvement from the one before. And so like religion, you always have some sort of adaptation to the new times. And so. You know, you start out with some pagan things. No, that doesn't quite work. So you augment it, you change it up. There's Christianity that comes around. But, you know, the Catholics just aren't, they don't quite get it right. So, you know, you got to have a, a branch off of that. So you have the Protestants. Pretty soon you get to Mormons or whoever. And so it's, it's sort of a, a statement is that, you know, humans are always augmenting uh, something that doesn't quite fit for them, and so they, they, they just they, they need to shape it for them. So does that make sense? There we go. All right, this one's called uh, Eros at Play. So Eros is uh, Cupid, right? St. Valentine's Day. But instead he has a tank turret for a head, and he's uh, making little turret-headed soldiers. And so it's, it's kind of a funny piece. 
Yeah, you're really laughing. For me. <laughs> this is called Reinhard von Halterkock. <laughs> and uh, would you believe it, uh, Robin Williams bought this. <laughs> so, a turret headed chicken. Uh, this one's called Through Death United. I decided to include a little rough sketch of what um, that was going to look like. So for you, I kind of wanted to give you an idea of just kind of how some of these ideas start out with. Somebody's phone is ringing. Is this a tiny or like a life size? This is uh, this is eight feet tall. Damn. So these are these skeletons are actually the torsos are three quarter size skeletons, but then the arms and legs are full size. So I wanted to play with the proportions a little bit. And so I, th I think it's good that um, you can kind of stylize anatomy in some way. And then there's a small child up there on top. This is a uh, sketch of the Play Parade 2 piece. And I'll show you something interesting about that. So there's this cat-like form and then this pedestal. But this is what it ended up looking like. So it was originally intended to be on a pedestal but it wound up being on a wall-mounted piece. And so, I was going to point out that, you know, not always do things go as planned. And so, what I wanted to talk about was that, you know, that the kind of art gods are sort of in control of you. It's like they decide how something's going to wind up. And so, I'm kind of at the mercy of that sometimes. You know, it's really helpful when you've got a deadline and a piece is telling you, no, it's not ready. Now we need some more. Need some more time, and so that's always a problem. But anyway, so if you look, that pedestal down there, which I had made, wound up on this piece. It's a piece called Dharma, Dharma Bovine, and uh, this ended up being a long island piece as well. So you can see how uh, those things changed. This is a piece called the Recreation. So I, I kind of wanted to be subtle about this, saying that God created gay people too. <laughs> yes, applaud. <laughs> I'm straight, by the way, in case you're... <laughs> I just love gay people. Just awesome. So this is a piece called uh, Sarabati Destroyer. And so it was kind of a fun little spin-off of something that should be peaceful and enlightening, but... No, it's a, it's a war machine. And so there's, it's kind of an aircraft carrier. There's lots of little airplanes and things happening there. What are the materials you're using to build these? Very good question. I totally forgot even to mention that. So most of these are model kits, like plastic model kits that you put together, you know. And so it's a conglomeration, mostly of those things. Some other collectible things like little resin figurines, um, toys, but you know mostly something that's of, of higher detail, and so they're they're made of those. Yes. Do you use like Dungeons and Dragons miniatures and stuff? No, I don't. And someone always asking that. Do you wear your D D when you're little? <laughs> so it's mostly like military historical figures. You know, I try to stay away from the fantasy side of things too much. I use some Star Wars, but not too much. Did you spray paint them all the same color then? Yeah, but I was getting to that. <laughs> uh, this piece is called an opera for the apocalypse. And so I tried to incorporate some kind of music element or rhythm or movement. And so this is one of my more favorite pieces. How big is that one? This one is... Um, I think it's it's over four feet wide. So pretty big. Yeah. This one is called a rather noble cock. <laughs> I must have a cock fetish or something. <laughs> Chicken. Uh, so it's this you know, this is about, you know, you know, world leaders that are all up in their own power and you know, they're just like, Yeah, we're amazing and when we realize that no, you're just you're just a lowly little chicken. You know, and we're all we're all just human at the end of it, and so it's just it's kind of making fun of world leaders, you know, having this illusion of power when you know really it is just an illusion. This is a piece called Venus admiring Mars's gun. <coughs> yeah. One of my favorites. 
this is a piece called A New Divinity. And so, uh, you know, I was talking about, you know, sort of modifying religion or making it new to fit you. So I, I came up with this idea that sort of borrows from different religions. And so you have this four-armed figure that's borrowed from, like, Hindu uh, beliefs. Uh, sort of a lotus or seated position. But there's this, you know, this heavy um, macabre element to it. And so this is uh, probably one of my more uh, famous works. And so I made a little video of it being built. There we go. Okay, watch closely.
uh, New York back to Hayes, and then Hayes to Portland, Oregon, to uh, the Nike dude's place. And this is it with a very fancy dropped-in background. <laughs> so this is an idea of like, you know, what what is the next civilization going to be like? You know, are we just going to be on sort of floating worlds because you know the terrain has become too harsh to live on? So it's just. It's just sort of about fantasy or the possibilities of, you know, what's next. So this is the part where I kind of offer you my um, knowledge or advice, you know, how the hell do you make it in the art world. I don't really know. I don't say to, that I know everything, but I can at least share with you uh, what's worked for me. And I think there's nothing wrong with breaking stereotypes about artists. And so, you know, I've, I've lived in Kansas my whole life, but I've been able to reach out to the world and show my art and be in, you know, pretty high profile galleries and art fairs. And so, you know, these are just some random things that I, you know, wanted to mention. Like, you don't have to live in New York City. You know, everyone wants to tell you that you do. Um, you know, don't be absorbed in your own vanity. I mean, don't be an artist just because, for its own sake, you know. I mean, you're doing things because of other people. You're doing things because it's for the world. You know, you have to look at it that way. Uh, starting your career for degree holders, obviously, you know what your options are. You can teach, which is, there's nothing wrong with that. It's a wonderful place to be. It's very uh, assuring. Uh, it's very comfortable unless you're on a lot of committees. So. Uh, jury shows is a good way to get started, entering your works into jury competitions, which have the possibility of cash awards. Uh, so it's all about building your show list. So in applying for a teaching position, they really look for you know the amount of shows that you've been in. They want to know that you're active. Uh, and this includes national shows, regional shows, Get into as many group shows as possible. Don't particularly approach galleries at that point. The thing is about galleries is they get so many submissions every day and they never write or respond back. They're like, ah, oh, another submission. You know, they just file it somewhere. Uh, but galleries are hunting for new people. So they actually come and find you. So you have to think of it that way. You know, just keep doing what you're doing. Just keep doing it, and they'll eventually find you. They'll eventually approach you. Um, be active as much as you can in the sort of art community network uh, as much as you can, but without taking too much studio time. And you know, don't give up. <laughs>